All right, welcome to Ferris Fishing, everybody. On today's little adventure, we actually are not anywhere. We are staying put for this video. I did I recently did a historical presentation for our local Grand Rapids Historical Society uh, that was held at our local Grand Rapids Library. We had about 75 people that showed out. It was a really good show out. Um, we had a lot of items that I had put together for people to see that I pulled out of the river. So what is this about? This presentation is going to be about magnet fishing and scuba diving and the items that we have found out of the river while doing these. Um, they have a lot of history to them. I've been able to find history on some of the items that we pulled out. So those are the items that we're going to be talking about today. All right, well, let's get into it. This is going to be less than a half an hour because uh, that's what I got. So who is Adam Gross? I'm Adam Gross, born in 1985, raised in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I still currently reside. I'm a kayaker, magnet fisher. I scuba dive, so I scuba dive the Grand River as well. Uh, I'm also a pyrotechnician, so I've done for our local Whitecaps um, baseball team. I've done the fireworks shows for that. I've also done uh, East Kentwood's fireworks show, kind of help out with those things. So I stay pretty busy during the summer. All right, what is magnet fishing? Well, if you don't know what magnet fishing is, basically take a big magnet like these, uh, a neodymium magnet, and you tie it to a rope, you toss it out in the water, and you see what you attract with it. So there are tons of metal items that are thrown inside the river all the time, lakes, streams, ponds, wherever. You can use these magnets all over the place. You also use um, grappling hooks. So as you can see in the picture there, we have a grappling hook. We'll use those to help assist with pulling items out, or if we see a bag that's not magnetic, uh, anything like that, we'll we'll throw that in the water and try to get those items out of the water. So what kind of magnets are there? There are several different kinds of magnets. Each one is like a tool, so each one kind of has its purpose. Um, so we have single-sided magnets, which is the magnet where it's just magnetic on one side, which is the bottom side of it. Then you have double-sided magnet, that means that it's magnet magnetic on both sides. Then you have clamp magnets, which is also magnetic on both sides and kind of on the side as well. But the clamp magnets are what you see in the picture here, and those are pretty sturdy. Those are really nice magnets. And then you have 360 magnets. Those are the elite magnets for magnet fishing. Those things are amazing. They, as, as the description says, 360, so they are magnetic all the way around, those things are amazing. So if you can get yourselves a 360 magnet, that's the main one that you're going to want to get. Um, so, but in the picture, we have clamp magnets. There are different ratings on them. Basically, the first one that you see with the grappling hook is rated at a 1,400 pound. So it's called a 1,400 pound clamp magnet. Uh, I believe it's Orion. It's a Kratos Magnetics. So if you go to kratosmagnetics.com, you can look up all these magnets on there. And if you'd like to buy yourself a magnet, put in Ferris Fishing for the discount code, and it'll get you 12% off your complete order. So anyway, the first one is the 1400 clamp magnet. Middle one is the 2400 clamp magnet. And then that last one is called a Kraken, and that's a 3800 pound pull clamp magnet. That thing's about nine pounds. It's huge. But the rating on these is for clean steel only. So like the middle one, it's rated to pull 2,400 pounds of clean steel. So not all the time do we, you know, are we able to pull that out ourselves? Uh, we do have other means of being able to pull items out or if our magnet gets stuck, we also can use our trucks. You can use pulley systems and uh, brute force, just get a bunch of people together and yank on that rope. So now if they get stuck and I can't get it undone, I'll jump in the water and dive and find where it is. So, history of magnet fishing. It dates back to 300 BC. Chinese used magnets to fish. They found lost weapons and tools. Miners used magnet for fishing for generations to find deposits of iron ore in rivers and streams. Magnet fishing is a global hobby and part of many industries. So, as you can see here, here's the image of me um, with a massive, probably 20 foot uh, pipe that I was able to pull out of the river. It's, uh, pretty heavy actually and then um so here's grand rapids this is where i live and where i was raised so um the reason why we would magnet fish here why it's such a good good area is just the amount of history i mean we we became a village in 1838 became a city in 1850 with the railroad industry started in 1854 furniture developing in the 19th century so we had a huge furniture um 
manufacturing here. And then uh, all this stuff kind of leads to lots of iron materials used to develop the city. Iron is metal, so iron is attracted, which is Ferris. That's why my name's Ferris Fishing, F-E-R-R-O-U-S. Um, there's Ferris and then non-Ferris uh, metals. So non-Ferris is non-magnetic and Ferris is magnetic metals, which is iron. Uh, we also have 16 bridges that span the Grand River. So the next slide here, as you can see, this here is all the bridges. Um, not all of them. We have plenty more than this, but this is all that's consolidated downtown. Uh, so starting from the top of the list is the bottom of the screen. So Fulton Street Bridge, 1928, is the bottom uh, second bridge there because the very first one in the corner is actually the highway. And then you can see the bridge there. So that's where Fulton Street Bridge. And then the list goes up to the top of the screen as the list goes down. So the next one is the Blue Bridge, Pearl Bridge, Gillette, Bridge Street Bridge, Sixth Street Bridge, which is the main one. That's the one that you can see with all the trusses, um, all the little tiny. It's the one unique one out of all of them. Uh, and then you got Leonard Street, Grand Truck Railroad Bridge, and then Ann Street Bridge as well at the very top there. So we're going to be mainly focusing on Fulton Street Bridge and Sixth Street Bridge for this presentation. So here we are. That leads us into Sixth Street Bridge. So this picture here is a picture of Venture Delo. That's exactly the name of his YouTube channel. So if you'd like to check him out, he also does magnet fishing. He's been doing it a little longer than me. Uh, this was a picture of them, him and his daughter coming downstream uh, to the shore where we were participating in the Grand Rapids Mayor's River cleanup uh, this past year, where the community comes together. We all get trash bags. We pick up a lot of trash from the shores and stuff and help just clean up the area. Um, but me, I was in the water scuba diving that day and ventured to low Cal and his daughter were inside of his boat magnet fishing. So we did a lot of cleaning up. But the main focus of this picture is the Six Street Bridge behind, which was built in 1886. It's the longest and oldest metal truss bridge in the state of Michigan. It's listed on the Michigan State Historical Site, and it's also listed on the National Register of Historical Places. So this thing has a lot of history to it. As you can see here, this is an undated photo of Six Street Bridge that I decided to add into this presentation. The only reason why I did was just to show the history of it. Um, so, like it says, undated. If you can see in the screen there across the bridge, there is a blown up image that I took of basically what is a carriage and horse, horse and carriage buggy that's going across it. So, this was back before cars were around. Um, yeah, so it's, it's just interesting to see. And I think way off in the back distance, you can see like a steamboat. All right, so history found under near Six Street Bridge. We've got a lot of history. There's tons of history, um, but we'll just focus on some a few things that I know about. As you can see in this picture here, we've got a lot of things. We've got a safe down in the bottom corner where you can see me diving um, and as we're using magnets and grappling hooks to pull that safe up. There's probably about five, six people that were helping pull that up. We've got here in the picture standing there is Ryan. He is with uh, Russic Treasure Hunters, so you can look them up on YouTube and TikTok. That is a six-cylinder engine that me and him were able to pull out from the corner of the bridge right where he's standing. Uh, we had help from a couple other people as well, so it was pretty heavy and pretty tricky, but we used some grappling hooks and magnets for that as well. And then you can see some other of the items there. We've got guns, horseshoes. Um, I got this case a metal box that was full of IDs, uh, bank cards that expired in 1986, a couple wallets and some other random stuff. Up in the top corner, you can see um, that is a block that has Roman coins from like the Roman era that's sealed inside of there. I found that scuba diving. Unfortunately, it's not real Roman coins. That was just designed as a paperweight, I found out, back in the 70s. So it's about worth 20 bucks, you know. Um, and then we have an old cart as well that uh, we were able to pull out from underneath the bridge. I found that scuba diving as well, got a bunch of people together, and then we ended up uh, getting together and pulling that thing out. That was the same day that we got the safe that you can see in the bottom corner there. I've found drone, as you can see. There's that other thing that's called a um, smudge pot, uh, and there's just all kinds of stuff that we pull out of here. So, 
This was something that was pulled off also by uh, fellow Magnet Fisher Scooter, is what I call her. She's a really awesome lady, and she does a lot of magnet fishing. Well, she found this off a of Sixth Street Bridge. What is it? It's a spittoon. Okay, and spittoons were containers for spitting into, especially for users of chewing and dipping tobacco, common in the late 19th century and early 20th century. They were typically made of brass, copper, iron, ceramic materials, placed in pubs, brothels, hotels, stores, banks, railways, carriages, courtrooms, and even the U.S. Congress had them. So this was an image that I found of a local store back in 1931. It's called the City Social Services Store Workroom. So this was an image that has a spittoon um, on the ground there. So they were very common, but it was extremely hard for me to find any photos relating to this that had any photos with a spittoon in the background. This was the only one out of hundreds of pictures that I went through, maybe even over a thousand. Uh, that had one. This uh, city, uh, social city service store was basically a store where a person would show up, fill out a list of rations that they needed, like canned goods, flour, things like that. They would give them the list and then they would pack it in the back into a bag and then give you and send you on your way. So that's what this image is. It is local, which is pretty neat. Who knows? Maybe that spittoon in the picture is the exact spittoon that we have. <laughs> I don't know. I only know of two that have been pulled out. All right, here we go. Some more Sixth Street Bridge historical finds. So this one's a real interesting one. This one involves a 1913 Michigan license plate. So we find a lot of uh, 1913 Michigan license plates. We found 1911 and 1914 Michigan license plates. They are called porcelain plates. And they hold up really well in the water for as long as they've been down there. So the main one that we're looking at is the bottom corner. That one's number 1646. Uh, that one was pulled up by Ryan. If you remember him in the previous slide with the engine, he pulled that off a of Sixth Street Bridge. Uh, and so during my research for this presentation, I was like, is there anywhere that I can go to find any sort of information or anything that shows these license plates are registered to an owner? Because every license plate, as you know, is registered to somebody in a vehicle. Uh, so I was like, do they have that system back then? They should if they have the place. Well, sure enough, they did. So I ended up doing some research and came across another YouTube video where a gentleman had showed off this book that you can see here. It's called The Automobile Guide and List of Registered Cars in 1913. This is specific to the West Michigan area of Michigan, which is perfect because that's exactly where we're at. And I said, okay. I've got to go down. So I made an appointment down at the Library of Michigan, which is in Lansing, Michigan. And when I went down there, we pulled a lot of 1913 Michigan plates off right by the Capitol. And so I decided I'll go down there early before my appointment, do some magnet fishing, see if I can get another Michigan license plate. And that's the one that you see in the upper corner where it's the Michigan 1913 and the revolver. So before going to check out this book, I ended up finding those two items. And then I went up checked out the book, got a lot of information out of there. It's really cool. Um, yeah, so the information that I obtained from it, which is uh, number 1646. So fortunately, they had a, a list of registered license plates. And it, it had basically, you have the number there, and then it says row, R-W-O-E, uh, West Side, Grand Rapids, 119 Northeast Prospect, and then Babecock. What does that tell you? Well, Roe is the last name of the person that it was um, registered to. Well, uh, He lived on the West Side, Grand Rapids, which is 119 Northeast Prospect. And then Babecock is the model of the vehicle that uh, it was registered to. So where does that give us? This is actual copies from the book. I was fortunate for them to give me a copy of this book. Um, there's only... Three known copies uh, in existence uh, that were made by them. Besides that, the one book is it. That's it. That's the only book that is known uh, to exist. There has to be a second edition to it because, unfortunately, the only plate that I was able to get was that number 1646 because not too long after this, the numbers stop. So they stop in the was that the four digits and a lot of our plates are five digit. So that's the stuff that I was able to get off of it. This is some of the um, ads from the book that you can see there. You got uh, automobile Studebaker, um, 
And then you can see the Hotel Cody, which was corner of Division and Fulton Street. Their rates were a dollar a night, up to a dollar a night. So pretty interesting. All right, here we go. So this is the information that I was able to find uh, um, linked to that license plate that was pulled out. So you have Babecock up in the corner. That's the model vehicle. That's So this was a 1913 license plate, but it was probably on a 1912 Babecock because that's the last year that they made those models. Uh, and then we have the house here, which is still there to this day uh, on 119 Prospect. And then on the corner there, you have William Sherman Rowe, which is who this license plate belonged to. Uh, he was born in 1880 uh, in Missouri, but he ended up dying at age 43 here in Walker, Kent County. He died from um burst appendix so that's something that nowadays you really you know you could die but the chances are very slim back then it just happened and there was no way to stop it so as you can see that is his um burial spot uh his headstone um he's still there uh his whole family's there so it's pretty interesting and then there's historical notes uh, about um bro here which is it is known that William S. Rowe, a very distinguished Grand Rapids citizen, lived in this home in the early 1900s. He was president and director of the large hotels, mainly the Herkemeyer, the Browning, and the Holding. He served as president and general manager of Valley City Milling Company and director of Michigan Millers Insurance Company. Mr. Rowe was president of the West Michigan Millers Association, president and manager of the East Side Water Company, and vice president of Globe Realtor company. He was director of the Furniture City Real Realty Company and the Michigan Manufacturers Association. So he was a lot of things. He's he was very well known in the community and his father was even more uh, well known in the community. So we actually have a plaque dedicated to his father um, by our Blue Bridge, the Blue Walking Bridge it's called. It's right by our um, museum downtown, Grand Rapids Public Museum. Uh, but very interesting. Those are the things that I was able to find on him. And pretty crazy to think that you're able to pull out a license plate and then find out who it belonged to in the history of them. So that's pretty cool. And then we're going to move on to Fulton Street Bridge finds. So this, this find here, we have a 1914 license plate. That was my first license plate that I ever pulled out, Magnet Fishing. That was off Fulton Street Bridge. And then we also have a street sign. We have a local street called Seward Avenue. Um, and this street sign, I did a lot of research looking at photos of, of our local street signs in the area, seeing if I could match any two, um, like the font design of the letters on the street sign. And the only one that I was able to match was a different street sign named Fuller Avenue, a local one. And that picture was taken in 1931. So that means that this street sign was around 1931 because I checked signs from the 1950s on up and none of them matched the description of this one that I pulled out. So it's placed in 1930s around there. Here's the Fulton Street Bridge. So this is back when it was an iron bridge. It is not that now. Um, we're talking about glass insulators here. So this glass insulator with the metal that I'm holding, that one I actually pulled up magnet fishing. It was stuck inside of a sandbag right off of um that one was actually off of sixth street bridge as well so it was in pretty good shape it's still stuck to its metal and stuff like that a lot of these things i get a ton of glass insulators especially diving there's a lot of them down there uh, mainly because as you can see where i have the arrow back then they had a lot of telephone poles and electrical lines that ran across the bridges and were attached and so that's where all those insulators would come from was the surrounding area electrical system. Uh, they're a lot of fun to find, different colors and things. So here's Leonard Street Bridge. This was taken back in 1930. Um, if you know the area, the bridge that you can see, the big main picture here, that is looking west. So uh, basically, if you're standing at Monroe and looking west, that's where that taken. The railroad tracks are no longer there. It is now a like bike path. Um, but the interesting thing about this is I've, magnif I've magnificed Leonard a lot, but I've also scuba dove um, the bridge and I found all these, there's hundreds of these uh, like porcelain looking um, vases down there and they're actually concrete vases. When I was doing research looking for old historical pictures of this bridge, I ended up coming across this. Now what you see here with the arrow down here by me is um, 
basically those are the items that I found in the water. There's hundreds of these things. So back then what they did when they demolished uh, um, anything, they just threw it in the river if it was by the river. So we've got hundreds of those little pillar things in the water. I just thought that was interesting. I always wondered where they came from. Now I know back in the 1930s. All right, here's a Toledo torch. This was pulled off of the um, Leonard Street Bridge as well. So what is a Toledo torch? Well, it was produced in the 1920s, used as road flares for construction zones. So these are basically your first construction zone lights, right? Um, filled with kerosene, lit to burn overnight. They also used them to melt snow on ice uh, from railroad tracks. So they would use them on railroad tracks. They also had bigger ones that were used in orchard to help keep the frost from landing on any of the um any of the product that they're growing all right leonard street bridge finds here we go these ones we've got world war ii dog tags world war ii grenades world war ii tank rounds uh, i've got two spur trigger revolvers that i found those are dated 1875 to 1895 a bunch of different weapons i pulled up a lawnmower vintage moped parking meters vintage coca-cola signs so as you can see in these pictures here you got a picture of me in the center there with one of my one of two uh, pineapple grenades. Those were World War II, luckily, training grenades, so they were not live. And then on the very top there in the middle, you can see Alan, my brother-in-law. He pulled up a tank round. It still had the firing charge in it, but it was not live. It had been decommissioned. So we ended up turning that over to the bomb squad. And then the most interesting one that I found off of Leonard Street would be the World War II dog tags that I found along with this asbestos uh, iron. So that iron there in the upper corner, that was basically your very old school version of iron for ironing clothes. But along with that, I pulled up these World War II dog tags. I was able to find out who they belonged to, which was Sergeant Clifford J. Voigt, after being on multiple news sites and multiple articles being written about uh, finding these. Well, I was able to find the family, get in touch with the family who... Uh, these belong to. So in the very top corner, you can see that's Clifford J. Voigt himself. And in the middle there, you can see me and I'm talking with his son and his grandson. Uh, we were able to talk together on live and a news group put that together for us, a local one from Mesa, Arizona, where he uh, lived and where they live. And so we were able to talk about it. Uh, he joined the service in 20, 20 years old, was a communications specialist among the first units to stumble upon Auschwitz, which was a Jewish con concentration camp. He also survived the landing of D-Day, left Michigan in 1952, moved to Mesa, Arizona, unfortunately passed away in 1995. Family didn't know where his dog tags went uh, until here I am many, many years later, like six years later. And all of a sudden they get a call that, hey, we think these belong to your dad. And sure enough, they did. So I was able to take those and mail them off to the family, and uh, now they have them. So they belong where they where they need to be. All right, railroad switch lanterns. There's Zan up in the corner. His um, the um, let's see, let me check real quick just to make sure that I'm right on this. The magnetizer. That is the name of his youtube channel please go ahead and check it out he does a lot of magnet fishing he found one of these really cool old lanterns i also have my buddy that found paul that found one of them i was able to find a local picture which was plainfield and leonard those railroad tracks are still there some of the buildings in the background as you can see are still there uh, that was taken in 1928 and in the very bottom middle corner middle of the picture i was able to zoom in and you can see one of those railroad lanterns there so We've pulled up two of them that I know of out of the river. I'm hoping to find one myself. They're just really cool history. All right, and then we have this here. I ended up finding this scuba diving between Leonard and Sixth Street Bridge on the west wall uh, in an area where no one really can magnet fish. Uh, but I found it diving, and it's super heavy. So in the in the far corner there, you can see where it says no pol no parking police order. This sign was found along with phones and all kinds of other stuff, but I couldn't find any information on this thing. And finally, eventually, I did. Uh, after doing a lot of research and looking in the background of photos, I ended up finding a, these couple photos that you can see here of the signs used back in the, in the 30s and 20s. These were popular. Um, they're called lollipop signs. And so, yeah, as you can see in the pictures, we got them there. Uh, so it was really exciting to find those. Um, so, yeah. All right. This is uh, called the Swing Bridge. This is in one of our 
older swing bridges, um, railroad track bridge. This bridge here can rotate, or it did back then. It was built in 1901. Uh, they had two sets of tracks on it, and in 1927, they removed one of the tracks, which was throwing it in the river. So I've gotten tons of railroad items out from there. We've got Samurai Store that I found. I also thought that this was just a piece of bar, um, like rebar, but it actually was a Thompson Center uh, firearm, 45 caliber muzzle loader. So I was able to clean that up, get some information off of it, really cool. And then you got two uh, railroad tools there that you can see. Um, the biggest one is called a spike puller. So that was used to pull railroad spikes out from the tracks when you're either removing them or replacing them. And then guns. Exciting, right? So here we have weapons. The very bottom corner there, you can see we have a um, Smith & Wesson 38 Special. That's the first uh, firearm found that I've ever had magnet fishing. That was off of the swing bridge that we just seen. And then we have multiple other firearms that I've found. Uh, the only one that I've ever found scuba diving is the one that you can see me there holding. And yeah, so in the big picture there with all the firearms, the two revolvers, the smaller ones, those are the spur trigger revolvers that date from 1875 to 1890s uh, that I got off Leonard Street. Pretty much all those I got off Leonard Street except for um, just two of them there. So, and then knives, we found knives, and then we've also got a shotgun that was pulled off of Fulton Street Bridge in two separate pieces. Uh, and then Sixth Street Bridge is that middle revolver with the bullets. And then Grand River is full of welding gas cylinder tanks. I mean, we got tons of these. This specific location, I dove the year later and counted about 22 um, of these tanks still left down there. So one of these days, we're going to try and see if we can get those out. But there are tons of these tanks all over the place in the Grand River. And then we got the motorcycles here. So I've pulled up two motorcycles four scooters, tons of, I can't even count how many bikes, stuff like that. It's crazy. So this is off Leonard Street Bridge, the one that's hanging down. And the other one is is kind of further north of Leonard Street. This one was in the same spot as the other one. You can see Scooter there in the middle. She's uh, helping me with that. It was just me and her. We ended up finding this motorcycle and was able to pull it out. We gave both these motorcycles to the police, turned it over, and then we got random finds here. We got the lawnmower that I found, we've got laptops and things like that. You can see in the bottom corner when it's really cold out, if we're magnet fishing, the rope will become full of um, ice chunks, which actually help with grip. And then you got all the little railroad tools. So there we go. That's it for that. Um, these are the Grand Rapids Historical Society Library of Michigan Grand Rapids Public Libraries. Those are my gratitudes to them. I really appreciate them without any of their historical efforts and digitizing all these historical photos that they find. Um, we want to have the information that we do nowadays. And then here is Rustic Treasure Hunters, Michigan Gems, Cradle Magnetics. That's where you can go to get a magnet again. We got Ficus and Toast, Venture to Low, and then don't forget the magnetizer. Um, so yeah, and then there's my channel, Ferris Fishing, down there in the corner. If you just punch that in, you're going to find the channel. And that's it for the presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'd like to do some more of these eventually on some items that I find later on in the future. Um, but like I said, if you guys are looking for any sort of magnets, go to kratosmagnetics.com. I'll have a link down below in the description. Find yourselves a really cool magnet fishing kit. Put in Ferris Fishing at the discount code. You'll get 12% off and they'll send it to you. So I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. Thank you to everybody for watching and your support. And I will see you guys on the next Bears Fishing Adventure.